Welcome at this time um, our moderator from The Hollywood Reporter, Justin Lowe. And the star of the film, James Wilder. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. That was a fun movie, wasn't it? Yeah. A couple unpredictable points there, and we'll, we'll get to those. It's a little bit of a twisty script, which uh, you find out as you get into it. Like any good thriller, things are not always what they seem. Um, so James, I want to know, since, um, since uh, Scott Fivillon's script is all about screenwriting, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how the script came to you. Is uh, it's Scott Fivelson actually? I think he'll appreciate that. Um, anyway, and he did. Uh, it was an odd way. I was, mm, I had taken a little sabbatical from acting for a while, which is a whole other story. Um, and I was at a lounge called Hemingway's, uh -huh. named after the great writer Ernest Hemingway, and. Um, a man, unknown man to me, tapped me on his shoulder. Uh, I turned around. He said, hi, I'm a writer. I said, oh, really? <laughs> the place, the motif is all books, so it's all about writers. And he said, I want to give you a script. And I said, about what? He said, about a writer. I said, <laughs> so really, you're giving me a script about a writer, and you're a writer in a bar named after a writer? I said, what, is like Ashton Kutcher going to jump right. out and say I'm punked? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> That didn't happen, and uh, it was real. I thought it was a odd sort of trifecta, yeah, and sure. uh, I read this script. I really thought it was incredibly challenging, mm -hmm. and I thought this was one of those things that can take you out of sabbatical, that if you fall on your face, mm -hmm. uh, everybody would say, well, he bit off a big piece, and he mm -hmm. couldn't chew it, but um, if you could pull it off, I thought it would be really an amazing thing to so, come out and do. So it really was that coincidental. Things like this do actually happen. They really do. And it's, it's <laughs> such a strange way. Yeah, they really do. Were there specific elements of the script that, that grabbed your interest right off? Well, um, you know, whenever you come to do a Hollywood story, it's always a little uh, precarious because the uh, wider demographic of the audience uh, knows Hollywood to be glamorous, um, like if you were to see the uh, travel brochures for Venice Beach, right. you know, it looks amazing, and then right. you get there and you lock yourself in a car yeah. and, it's uh, mixed, you know, mixed see, outcomes. look for a sharp object. So um, that's sort of the uh, diametrical opposition of doing that, is right. if you do a Hollywood story all of the way it's really done in Hollywood, um, it's taken strangely by the public, mm -hmm. um, and if you make fun of it in a mockery, uh, Hollywood kind of, so this sort of hit that, that balance. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really poking fun right. at Hollywood, but it was a Hollywood story. I don't know if I answered your question. Well, did, did, did you feel like it was a kind of a narrow line to walk? Did you feel Definitely. like it was gonna be a little bit of a balancing act in what way? Well, in just that, I mean, when, I think number one, when you're talking about something that's like incredible, that we're talking about the entire script, right. uh, it'd be like describing the most beautiful woman in the world mm -hmm. beyond the looks of Bridget Bardot or Marilyn Monroe. You can't show that girl right. because nobody will agree with it. Right. So in the uh, concept, it was the greatest script that was ever written. I think uh, it was, uh, you know, an intelligent choice not to ever have to reveal that, right. if that makes sense. So w when you initially read the screenplay, did you associate your character, Bobby Blue Day, the, the has-been screenwriting instructor, with any other memorable screen characters come to mind for you as you were reading that role? Hmm, that's a good question. I had a uh, writer in mind that I, uh, that I know that I kind of used mm. as a bit of a template mm -hmm. for myself. Did you have any performances in other films, even if it wasn't the same subject matter? Mm. No, not really. Okay, I'll tell you who I'm thinking of. Really? Yeah, Travis Bickle. Travis Bickle, anyone? Taxi Driver? Wow. He had that same kind of intensity and dedication to a misguided vision. I see. Um, well, so <laughs> I'll take that. So that that's why I kind of wondered is you know, is exactly. that uh, it, did me... anything come to mind when when you were reading that that really struck you that way? Mm. Um, 
So when you were de reading the script and then, you know, getting into the role and developing the character, which is, you know, a little bit challenging, he's n none of the characters in that film are particularly likable in the classic sense. Right. Um, were, what were some of his fundamental faults and virtues that you were trying to get a hold of and internalize in your preparation process? That's a very good question. Uh, well, you know, you, uh, it, it's, <clears throat> you want to see that the guy could have been and was successful, right. um, but broken, right. uh, but still has a chance. Sure. So again, the polarity of those things, it's like water running this way and running that way. Um, and uh, that was a bit of a, uh, you know, a difficult coincidence to sort of play, but I thought it was very important well, you know, the person that was playing opposite was so young sure. and kind of naive uh, in, 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 his, his, uh, in his character that that was a good um, character to play tennis against right. because, uh, you know, we were very different in, in types and yeah, styles. Yeah, kind of polar opposites. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I looked at it a little bit like predator and prey. Mm, sure. So where you don't want to kill the prey too early. Right. Um, but you don't want to come across as the predator the entire film. Sure. Um, so, um, I don't know if that well, answers your question. Bo Bobby's, um, Bobby's faults are on full display, and they get right. clearer and clearer as we go through the film, but right. m the majority of people are not all bad and all wrong. What did you see as some of his virtues? I mean, obviously, he had had a career that he was trying to regain. Yeah. There might have been some virtue in that, but fundamentally as a person, were there virtues of his character that you were trying to grasp so that you could play against those? Yeah, that's, uh, those are sort of like internal questions that if you telegraph them, it is just so obvious. I mean, I always feel the audience is a step ahead mm -hmm. of the people making the mm -hmm. film. And I think you have to approach it that way. The audience is smarter than the people making the film. Right. So many mistakes get made when people go, oh, they'll never you know, expect this. So um, yeah, a lot of those choices were internalized right. and I thought would come up through just maybe you know, a look or an expression. And if it comes across, right. great. And if it doesn't, at right. least you're not telegraphing. I mean, in, in a lot of films, we'll see what screenwriters will do is they won't try to tell us that the character is virtuous. They'll have another character tell us, oh, Bobby is such an amazing screenwriter, has always been such a fantastic teacher, has been a great mentor to me you know, yeah. throughout my education. This is a small cast. There aren't a lot of characters <laughs> commenting on other characters. Right. Yeah. So establishing those virtues for Bobby is a little bit difficult. I agree. This just had writing and acting. I mean, that's yeah. basically all you had going for it. And um, the writer here, Scott, I really appreciated the fact that he gave the trust to the actors to be able to communicate without doing expository dialogue and exactly as you're saying, sure. to explain to the audience right. what the actors are missing and communicating that isn't an easy delivery. Right. Did you feel like it was it was a key decision in the script to keep the Stephen Worthy character hidden throughout the entire film? behind that pane of glass, one-way glass, so to speak? Uh, well, it wasn't a choice. He wasn't there. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, but, I mean, so, the character was never right. introduced into the film. Right? right, and I think he, you know, he, he well, that was a writer's choice, sure. and, I, and I was very, uh, uh, I don't know if I would say gracious, but thankful as an actor that the writer didn't all of a sudden reveal uh -huh. that character. I think it was much more powerful to keep him uh -huh. as a, an, an idea right. as opposed to a so physical character. For, right, so not being a physical character, did you find it challenging to sort of play to that nemesis that was never materialized, it was never well, externalized? Well, yeah, to keep him fresh because he's brought up so many times right. and, it, and he has to be, um, so you want to bring it up in a fresh way so it doesn't seem like it's too repetitive. Right. And particularly in that final monologue, in right. the interrogation room, you really yeah. have to sort of make us believe right. that Bobby believes anyway. Uh, that, that Bobby believes right, anyway. <laughs> that Stephen is really, really there, <laughs> exactly. which means we have to believe, almost believe that he could really be there. Yeah. So yeah. that's one of the, the brilliant parts of that scene is that you can convince us, you can make us doubt ourselves. Right. Bobby is so convinced he's there, you say for a minute, wait a minute, maybe, maybe he, he is really there. is, right. maybe he really does exist, and then 
Maybe not. I try to do a couple other subtleties too, you know, uh, via good writing and also ideas for myself, you know, with like, you know, the, he's an addict. I mean, you know, like a recovered sure. addict, so to speak, and his thing about he need more coke, you know, a little right. bit of the double entendre with that. And sure. you can kind of see the way he's so clutchy about it that I didn't want to make it too obvious, but also that you saw that this guy's just ready to be unhinged, yeah. you know, at any moment, yeah. and the other characters and what, with that. And what, you know, in terms of backstory, what do you think has brought Bobby to that point? I mean, he had a career. Mm. This is where I use that template. Right. Um, you West know, Coast, presumably, now he's in New York teaching, which is not his chosen career. I, I think when someone has success too early, mm. and they can't appreciate it, uh, I'll give you an example with myself, I did a, a show that, um, had won the Emmy, uh, you know, for best one hour drama that was kind of the top tier in television. And I was uh, so young and arrogant that I didn't go because I didn't want to be, you know, rolled into television. And it, it, it was so foolish, I didn't really know better, you know. And now with this little simple film, that's, the budget's smaller on this than it was on this TV show, sure. and of one you know, uh, not to sound arrogant, but uh, uh, several awards for acting and independent spirit and all these cool things. I, I have so much appreciation for it right. that I didn't have that. I think that is this character. Okay. This character was too young. Right. He had his success too early. He had it all. He had Hollywood. He had the ropes. He had the, you know, fractional ownership on somebody's G5 jet and, you know, <laughs> All those things that are important to someone at that age and the trophy sure. and the money and then abused it because there are no parameters in Hollywood when you're part of the American monarchy system here mm -hmm. um, that um, pertain to you. Right. So uh, he collapsed and he became an ousted element. You know, people didn't want anything to do with him mm -hmm. because he was now poisoned, irregardless of his talent. Right. So, mm. it, it, his, and his addiction, it kind of manifests that self-destructive tendency that he has. His he pissed a lot of people off. A bit, bit of a hair trigger <laughs> temper there. You so, know, let that be a like, reminder to all of us. Why didn't you go to the Emmys? Right. You know, exactly. Right. <laughs> I noticed that why myself. Why don't you go to New York and, <laughs> right. and get yourself together? Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, you shot the film uh, in New York City with Hilarion Banks directing. Um, yes. How many days were you shooting and what was your experience working with uh, a director who is first and foremost a cinematographer in terms of his, his skill set and his background? Well, it was really cool. I mean, I, I, I thought he shot in a very kind of Cassavetes style, you know, where he trusted, you know, that the, the, uh, the acting would be um, not improvisational, because I think people mix that up with Cassavetes, but that the actors are going to get to explore, you know, and really right. bring things uh, to the part. And that's always nice, you know, right. when a director isn't there with an iron fist. And sure. It isn't a big ego battle. Um, and this movie, I was just in New York, and the uh, weather condition when I made the movie a couple of years ago was exactly the same, except mm. the, uh, the subway stop was different. Our subway <laughs> stop was Jamaica right. um, and New York City for this. So the compression and the cold weather and all that stuff, I decided as an actor, you know, um, let that, uh, you know, uh, let that be part of it. I think I heard yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio actually on this very right. uh, stage say something that a director told him when he was making uh, Boy's Life uh, that he said, you know what, um, we got it. You're, you're, you're tired and you're feeling pain. He said, but pain is temporary and film is forever. <laughs> and I went like, wow, that's <laughs> profound. And you know, that is really true. You got to, you know, man up and, and bring that part because if, right. if one part of the chain uh, of the film falls apart, it kind of falls apart right. for the audience all the way across. Right. Was there a lot of improvisation involved? I mean, how many days did you shoot? You probably on that budget didn't have a whole lot of time to rehearse. Hey, to no, when I, when I say improvisation, I mean it more just ah. like the heart of, of, of the character and the direction. It wasn't improvisational at all. And yes, there was no time for rehearsals. I think the entire shoot was maybe 19 days. Wow. And yeah. uh, I was in 76 pages of a 90 some odd page script. So I've done plays and I had to come play ready. I mean, off book so that, right. you know, if we had to do a cover set and jump to you know page 14 I better be ready because right. you know no prep time. There, there's no time I'm <laughs> a six no day net. shoot 12 hour day to go home and like right. you know learn lines right the uh, the the lighting on the the set that they use for the apartment um, at least I I watched it on a yeah. screener link that that uh, that was provided um, it seemed like it was very dim 
Like, mm. I mean, did when you were working on that set, did it feel to you like it was a dimly lit set? Or, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> it and did. What, what does um, that bring with it? I mean, a lot of depression. Really um, <laughs> right. You know, uh, you're like, wow, you know, you're not going to look good here. Right. That's one thing, but you know, you're. You've got, you know, you're past your mark. This is right. maybe this is, uh, you know, yeah. this art imitate life or life imitate art. You know, maybe you're here for a reason. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it, it was, it was stark. <laughs> uh, you know, I wanted to carry my own bounce guard, but uh, right. you know, the kind of. But he, it was he a tough for the shot. He lit it. He had specific aesthetic and and character driven reasons for that lighting. Uh, yeah, presumably, presumably so. Presumably, <laughs> wasn't all a budget decision. So yeah, I, you know, and so I I, uh, I I trusted that, and so I feel like you know uh, one of my favorite writers of all time, you know, Sam Shepard, the Pulitzer Prize winner, and uh, True West, which every actor that's ever gone to an acting class, you know, loves the Quaid brothers and those two brothers, and I felt like I was trying to look at it this. This way of you know these aren't two uh, surfers in Malibu fighting over who gets the convertible Ferrari today. You know this this was real you know m man stuff and uh, and I I looked at that play as these two characters in a pressure cooker that mm -hmm. that, that you know they love each other and right. then they grow to hate each other and then. So that was like, a reference point for you in looking at that that. I think when you the relationship between the principal characters. Yeah, you want to manifest things uh, for the story, you know, where you want to manifest relationships mm -hmm. in the story that maybe the writer, you know, has in his mind, and then he sees, oh, these are the guys that are playing my story. It changes, you know, yeah. and so for me, I wanted to kind of, you know, manifest this and project a story onto it that I thought, wow, this would be great. Why, why not shoot for a, a really high mark mm -hmm. and. If we were come there, close, it'd be were great. Were there other films or performances or, or material that you, you brought to the, the film and the character in that Travis same way? Bickle? Yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I put Travis Bickle in on IMDb, nothing against IMDb, but it came up with something totally random. I'm like, really? Travis Bickle is pretty singular. I'm <laughs> right, thinking, right. should be able to find that. But yeah. apparently there's more than one reference to Travis Bickle. Um, Interesting. Yeah, as the film plays out, though, it seems like Bobby kind of vacillates between this desire to make a big score and make his mark in the industry again and really you know obtain the approval of the that's it invisible big time producer Stephen Worthy I think you hit it on the head if you were to give me what is the operatives I think it's what what drives us all in an odd way is you're you know everybody's seeking approval you know especially artists you know or you know, seeking to, I mean, for me to sit in this audience tonight and watch this movie with all these, right. you know, fellow constituents with SAG and, and oh my God, you know, <laughs> are they all going to get up and leave? You know, it's I like a very it. friendly You know, I drove all the way here tonight. for that. I don't care about my validated parking. <laughs> get me out of here. You know, I thought maybe I should have sat outside, but I thought, you know, what if they ask you something about the movie that you don't remember and you're like, um... No, oh, that won't be good. You're an I actor. said, man up, you sit cover. down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so from your perspective, which one of those poles does he does he gravitate towards one or the other, or is the tension in the performance the the shift between both of them? He shifts from one to the other, sort of. Fr I lost you on wh so the, which the one first was one being his his drive to make a big score, right? He knows oh, I see. that he you know if he yeah. sells this he's going to be back in the game. I think he's it's just be as simple as seeking approval. So it's really you know, more whether about he gets that fractional ownership back right. on his jet and right. the 66 foot Hatteras at Marina Del Rey, right. or you know someone says that is really one of the best screenplays I've right. ever seen in my life, and it just depends what's important to you at that juncture in your life. You know, as an artist, I think many people come in to this business for, and they don't want to say it, you know, fame and fortune, you know what I mean? And, you know, they, but, um, you know, everybody, I mean, who doesn't want to be, you know, uh, 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 a, a heralded artist, sure. you know, where people say, wow, that was great. And then you really realize how hard it is, you know, and, and the form of rejection is endless. Yeah, well, that, you know. that, that scene where Bobby's trying to deliver the script to Steven's place kind of right. brings it <laughs> all to the forefront. If yeah. anybody's looking for professional humiliation, yeah, hopefully exactly. they'll take a page from that book and not attempt anything like that. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, don't yeah. want to be, don't want to be pinned down in your in your idol's driveway. Probably exactly. not a good place to be. <laughs> but I mean, like that scene. Besides, you know, some of these, you know, 
unsavory characteristics. Um, the film also displays a fair amount of, you know, kind of dark humor. How did you approach those scenes without really tipping the performance over into black comedy, which it's definitely not? Um, but there's some kind of dark humor yeah. that's going on there. Keep it anchored in truth. Mm -hmm. You know, let the audience um, find the humor. You know, because I could hear it like there'd be a laugh here at this and, you know, maybe a couple people over there at some other line. There wasn't any universal like, you know, set, set, blow, like in half hour comedy, like, oh, that's the joke, you know, get the joke. Uh, there wasn't any joke, it was anchored in truth and sometimes people's humanity can relate to fractured characters where they say, wow, that's happened to me. I mean, now that I'm witnessing it, it's funny, but what's happened to me is absolutely not right. funny. Right. So. so then, so while you're focusing on the truth, how do you hang on to that little bit of, that little bit of sense of comedy? Timing. Oh, did I blow it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in the delivery, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, the timing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I think that comes through. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes we don't know whether to cringe or whether to laugh at right. this behavior. And, yeah. and yeah. that's kind of where it's supposed to be, balanced on that knife edge about being sort of creepyish and desperate and sort of, you know... Humorous able, in a black way. Right, being really able to relate to being there. It's funny yeah. as long as it's not us. Exactly, <laughs> as long exactly. As it's to somebody yeah. else. Yeah, everybody wants the, the ticket, I guess, in Indianapolis, 500. The most expensive tickets are turn three because that's where all the crashes happen. Right. But yet, nobody wants to see anybody die. <laughs> you know, we want to see cars go around the track 200 miles an hour and crash, but we don't want to see anybody die. Right. So it's like, wow, those are the most expensive tickets. Right. Well, and, and hopefully your, your cast and crew was supportive about yeah. keeping you safe. <laughs> well, the very first day I knew that this is, because they're uh, engaged in the same winter hell conditions that I am. Right. And that the very first day, um, and and you know on independent films, the crew is there because of, uh, not for big paychecks, right. you know, for heart and belief in the project, that um, they better get knocked out that first day from some performance or you're going to spend the entire time trying to win your crew's right. loyalty. So um, we so tried I, to put a big scene up front. Yeah, I was going to say, know? which one was yeah, that? Yeah, it, it was like that. one of those, uh, and it was, you know, so lucky to have Scott too, where he took uh, uh, the courage to write what you don't see anymore, like a seven or eight page scene for actors. And because, you know, everybody's yeah. attention span is so narrow now. Um, that uh, we put that up right front and, you know, I was like, I better nail this. You know what I mean? This is going to be, you know, the do or die, whether right, the crew exactly. loves you or hates you. Right. Um, so, so your cast on set. And they hated me. <laughs> <laughs> They're all still here. Um, <laughs> right. The, the, That's them now. Thank you. <laughs> the, the rest of the cast you had on set was essentially two other characters. Right. Right. And they weren't on set. And you they, know, until they were. Right. Yeah. Oh, you mean, you mean Sailor and exactly. Zuhier. Yeah, Sailor That's was there for a few days. 70% of the movie, right? Right. That, right. That particular setting. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how, d how did you kind of map out that sort of the emotional terrain about how Bobby related to these other people that he essentially had to con, or right. if the con didn't work, he had to come up with some other? Terrain? Well, I tried to, it, it, it's a very good question because it's very difficult. It's very difficult to have that kind of relationship where people are hiding things. We know this from love relationships that we really don't know in our love relationship, what's really going on with the other person because they're so good at masking it and hiding it and layering it and whatnot. And here, I, my relationship was with the other character, but it's also with the audience. So in a kind of a discreet way, I was trying to, you know, uh, give uh, moments of thought and, and, and looks where the audience was going, oh, something's going on with him there, you know, and, and then go through a transition where the character may see that the other character sure. could see some of those things and then not see other things, you right. know, kind of toying with the gun idea and then he turns his head and then right. there's a little bit of like, you weren't supposed to see that, right. you know, those kinds of things. Did, did you ever feel at all that, that Bobby's character was kind of bifurcated and he was almost two different characters. Like most of his other character was in the backstory, but it kept right. getting referred to. And so it was self, so self-referential, right. um, both, both by you know, his screenwriting student, Jack, and you know, his own references. I almost felt like Jack was two different characters, not to go into The Shining here or anything, but right. something like that where he had you know, his past successful character and now where he was in the moment. Yeah. 
I, 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 I agree. That's what I was kind of striving for mm -hmm. and hopefully hit that chord um, so that you see someone that has some sort of self-deprecating humor about his current failure in life now, even though he had monstrous success. Right. So when the other people are heralding him for his success, you see that he's got, you know, a, a little thought, you know, uh, cycle going on with like, boy, I wish I had handled it before, like I have the intelligence to sure. now handle it, and I would probably still be there. Right, 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 doing something different. Mm. So, you know, looking ahead, when you're considering new projects, what are some of the principal characteristics you're looking for? As you said, you took a bit of a hiatus before this project. Right. Um, you know, going forward, what, what kinds of projects are you thinking will work for you? Did this give you new ideas about kinds of opportunities you're looking for? Well, it's certainly uh, so much fun to come back into the game with knowing that, that film really, it's so, it's so, so uh, warms my heart that I got, I got out for a while because independent film became like, nobody wants independent film anymore. And I've always been interested in, you know, I started as a street performer and, you know, and did Broadway and whatnot. I I'm, I'm very much relate to that, that small audience and that one-on-one -on -one thing. And then when it came into, you know, Marvel Comics and superheroes and all the, you know, 1970s TV shows and animated films, it's fantastic the audience you know relate to it. but I really had no interest in playing any of those things I just didn't find it communicated to me right. so it's really nice to see that independent films are back sure. you know it's like little films like you know uh, you know Birdman and on and on and on and Whiplash it's like everybody's like so excited to have stories with characters sure. and, and their their dramas and their toils and troubles so I'm kind of Glad to be back in the ring, you know, uh, to whatever way that I am, yeah. and um, and that the industry is open to basically a lot of outside fa financing that's right. coming in, that's allowing uh, uh, a riskier film projects right. to come in since there's so much money outside of America right. right now. Well, and so you know, you mentioned some of the the big independent films of of the past year, right? Um, and you know, among current movie releases and and TV series. Are there any that you think are giving young actors the chance to experience um, the industry the way that you did and give them the kind of opportunities for a diversity of roles um, that, that you've had in your career? Well, where I can like, you know, eat my, you know, put my foot in my mouth is that where I had this attitude that television, irregardless of what level you were on and what award your show won, if you look at, Arquette, who's on CSI, won Best Actress, you know, and Matthew McConaughey, who's, you know, on a, on a TV show with Woody Harrelson, wins Best Actor. I mean, what an idiot, you know what I mean, to think that these mediums are now not completely uh, uh, one and the same, sure. you know. So I think uh, the, the mediums are, uh, I think every, you know, if, if, if somebody can get on a great TV show or any TV show or, or even, uh, what are they doing now, net series, mm -hmm. of, so web series. Yeah, yeah uh, it's fantastic. I mean, everybody has a camera now, you know, everybody's a cinematographer, the camera corrects for yourself. You don't even need a lighting department. It's built, <laughs> built into your iPhone 5. It's fantastic. So, so. Do you feel that there's a lot more opportunity that way than there used to be? I think so. I mean, geez, when I did this uh, series, there was just three networks, right. you know, that was it. You know, and the prime time was two hours. It was like, it was, you know, unbelievable the, the, how narrow the slots were. And now they're just like, I can't keep up with everything that's yeah. out there that's fantastic, yeah, yeah. you know. So a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity for folks in this room. We're going to take a few questions. If you put up your hands, we'll try to call on you. I know there must be some questions out there. Yes, gentlemen. I'm just going to repeat the question so yes. everybody can hear it. So the question is, um, does the film yet have a theatrical distribution schedule, and what's the plan going forward? Uh, you know what? Yes, it does. And for me, um, I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an odd bird, but I love that it's playing at a Lemley, at the music hall, uh, and I as a, 
Is it? Oh, thank you. All right, great. I'm great with the right theater. crowd here. This is so cool. Great location. Love it. I mean, I, I in an odd way, I, I, you know, you know, the Cinerama Dome. You know what I mean? I kind of like the Lemley Music Hall right. is so cool, and uh, you know, so yeah, that's coming out March 27th in March that location. March 27th. That's just a couple and weeks away. At the uh, in in back East Coast and a bunch of landmark theaters too, which are really cool Great. theaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, off the skyscraper or whatever. That to me was the change mm. where I got connected to the character and I cared about you. And I stayed that way through the, throughout. It didn't matter what you did. I didn't care if you had a gun in your hand. And I just kind of wanted you to talk about that story. So, okay. so let me just quickly say the question is about the scene on the rooftop when, when Bobby threatens to throw Jack over the top of the roof and, uh, and the questioner is saying that's when she really connected with the character and, uh, and what else? I wanted him just to talk about it. Talk about that moment and, and the shift in the character. Uh -huh. Okay, well, uh, it's a great question. And, um, you know, when you're looking at something as a, uh, I'm trying to see it as an audience, and and when we're in that set, that's the compression of the set is like a a, a, a boiler with the top and the lid on it, and it's just the pressure is building and building and building. And that top has got to blow. I felt that. You know, I want to pick that moment that I think you saw where I was uh, like almost like kind of crying a little bit of like feeling so remorseful that I let things go this far. And whether that was for me or for him or for everyone, I wanted to leave that ambiguous. And so I felt that um, now we're in a big arena. We just came out of a, you know, a lunchbox into Manhattan's skyline and a rooftop. And I thought, this needs to be played large, but you got to bring it back home. So I wanted it to go um, into uh, uh, heightened reality, but keep it anchored in reality. And so since it got to that level of, you know, pushing someone off a rooftop, you know what I mean? It then you had to bring it back home so the audience could see that it wasn't just done for, um, you know, like watch the fireworks and, you know, bring, you got to bring it back home. So you really had to commit to that scene and keeping it grounded yeah. in the reality of the character. And what a great place to make somebody have an audience like love you right after you almost killed someone. You know what I mean? Because that's where I think, yeah, diametrical opposition comes into play. Because there's some things I haven't seen the film in a while too. And I went like, it surprised me. I went like, oh, wow. You know, like, Oh yeah, that was really cool. You know what I mean? That was. That was yes, good sir. Choice. Question over here. Who played Sailor? The actress who played Sailor. Rebecca. Rebecca. Rebecca, Rebecca Palmer. Yeah, she was. She was really nice. Really yes, sir. good. Right there. So the question is, to, with, with the different roles you've played, do you frequently play a villain character? Or do you have a preference in the roles that you select? It's a very, very interesting question. And I'll tell you why. I started an all-boy parochial school in San Francisco. And it was an accelerated learning institution that uh, I always wondered why they just didn't give us rich dad, poor dad. You know what I mean? But instead, we were learning pre-calculus. And I was like, how does this teach us how to be a, cal a capitalist? You know what I mean? We can go to NASA, but I just don't get when we're starting to multiply you know, uh, 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 alphabet letters, you know, X times Y. Where is it? Well, how does this apply? So where there was a very bohemian movement in San Francisco that was kind of very contrary, cobalt blue with gray slacks and a tie every day. And um, I decided to go out and find the artist in me since I felt so confined in this learning institution. Nothing wrong with it. Um, and I started to uh, eat fire. And I think I was like nine years old at the time. Now, San Francisco had the great quake, 
But what leveled the city was the fire. So here's a nine-year-old kid with a burning torch standing on the street, and you're going like, this looks like trouble. It was an audience gatherer. So I wrote a show around that. I had a one-man show, and I was like juggling and eating fire and doing chain escapes. Houdini was my hero at the time. So I came down, and I, I went to the Moulin Rouge when I was 14 years old, and I was performing there in Pigalle. Uh, and um, performing and living there by myself. And, you know, it was just like Moulin Rouge, the movie, except they spoke French, and I didn't. So um, that was, you know, a little bit of a difficulty. And then when I came here, I came down to Los Angeles, and I was actually a street performer in uh, Venice, and tried to bring juggling, which is like, who cares about juggling, to a new level. And I thought, what's something that no one's done? And I juggled three running chainsaws. Um, and that... That actually got me to the Greek theater, to the Roxy, to the whiskey, whatnot. And it was kind of, there was a lot of humor to almost, uh, you know, self uh, 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 masticate, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, juggling running chainsaws can be funny. And so the problem was, as some people were trying to push me into acting, and they said, you know what, he's funny. He's well, I mean, I, he doesn't look funny, but he's funny, and we don't want to see him. And I got so pissed. I changed my name, and I said, I'm going to go straight for drama. And one of the first roles I got was adapted from a book called Brothers in Blood, and it was called Murder One. It was a movie for Miramax where I played the title role of a guy that was at Reedsville State Penitentiary for killing six people. And I met this guy. I flew there to meet him, and he was shackled down to a concrete. As soon as I did that role, this is where you remember me. You don't remember me as a chainsaw juggler. Now everybody knows me as a super intense serial killer. Wow. And it was like I started going into the direction of everybody saw me as like, you know, uh, Chris Walken, Eric Roberts. I mean, great actors, not comparing myself with them. But those kind of parts that were like these lovable psychotics. And I thought, you know what? These are great parts to play. I really enjoy it. And uh, I guess there'll be a time to be funny at some other point in your career. Yeah. So you're kind of playing against your own type there yeah. a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's funny. It's so funny. maybe some comedies next. Well, you know, like Michael Caine says, you never know where fame comes from. So, you know, it came from chainsaws and it came from, you know, playing serial killers. Right. Any more questions? We have time for another couple. If there's anybody else, put up your hand. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Oh. Wow. Thank you. Any more compliments or of questions? <laughs> That's a good note to end on if we right. don't have any more. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, James.